Don't you want devoted followers who leave their families for you, give their money to you, give their bodies to you, give up their lives for you, consider you God, and will kill for you? Don't you want to become a cult leader? Hello and welcome to Serial Killing, a podcast where we also veer off the serial killer path to delve into other topics within our beloved true crime community. Today's podcast, which was voted for on Instagram, will be on the cult Children of God. So let's go back to its genesis, if you will. So in the beginning, there was David Brandt Berg, born on February 18th, 1919 in Oakland, California. So let's get into some history at that time. World War I, or the Great War as it's called, had just ended months before. It is known as one of the deadliest wars in history, with an estimated 9 million military personnel deaths and around 7 million civilian deaths connected to that war. Then to that, add another 50 to 100 million deaths from genocide and an influenza pandemic, and you might get an idea of the death and destruction. Also this year, the German Workers' Party was formed, which eventually became the National Socialist German Workers' Party, or the Nazis. Romania annexed Transylvania. Irish Militant Nationalist Party, Sinn Féin, created its own parliament in Dublin and declared Ireland independent of Great Britain, sparking the Irish War of Independence. The Polish-Soviet War began. In Italy, the fascist party was formed by Benito Mussolini. Also this year, the 18th Amendment to the United States Constitution prohibiting alcohol was ratified by nearly all of the United States and the United Parcel Service, or UPS, was formed. We also see that Mahatma Gandhi announced a resistance against the Rowlett Act, which was a legislative act passed by the Imperial Legislative Council in London, indefinitely extending, quote, emergency measures in order to control public unrest and root out conspiracy in India. Some other notable people born in 1919 were Jackie Robinson, the famous baseball player, Nat King Cole, the singer, Liberace, and Andy Rooney. So this was the atmosphere that David was born into. And now I know you guys do not think that I really need to do the disclaimers that I do. If you're familiar with this group, you already know. There's a lot of intense sexual pedophilic issues in this. So if you're squeamish with that, and I kind of am, you're not going to hurt my feelings. Just close out of this podcast. No harm, no foul, okay? Okay. So David was the youngest of three children to his Swedish-born father, Jalmar, and Reverend Virginia Berg. Both were Christian evangelists. His maternal grandfather was also a minister to the Disciples of Christ in Muskogee, Oklahoma. The Disciples of Christ is also known as the Christian Church, the Disciples or the DOC. So from birth, deep-seated religion was a part of the entire fabric of his being. He came from a family that were proud, deeply committed Christians. His mother's family had been members of an offshoot of the Church of the Brethren, but state persecution of the sect drove his maternal family from Germany to America. So side note, if you remember my podcast about Aleister Crowley, he also had ties with the Brethren as well. 
Now, David had stated in his life that his mother, Virginia, influenced him the most. She was, of course, raised Christian, but while in college, she had become a self-proclaimed atheist and went a little wild. But after the birth of her first child, she was in an accident that broke her back, which left her bedridden for five years and oftentimes near death. But she did finally recover and became active in her Christian roots again. It didn't take long for Virginia and her husband, Jalmar, to begin testifying to the, quote, divine healing that Virginia had received, thus getting them kicked out of the disciples of Christ. This was against their particular doctrine. So the couple joined the Christian Missionary Alliance, and this was the denomination they belonged to when David was born. But, you know, this wasn't a good fit for the couple either, which led them to eventually become independent pastors and evangelists. Most of David's early childhood was spent traveling with his family and their extreme passion for their religion. When David was five, the family finally settled in Miami, Florida, because Virginia had led many successful, large revivals at the Miami Gospel Tabernacle. He lived there until he was 19 years old. Now, one story out of David's life was that he said when he was becoming a teenager, another older teen taught him how to masturbate while in a church. Later, his mother caught him doing this, and as the story goes, she forced him to finish masturbating in front of his own father. Since both of his parents were full-time pastors, they survived only on what charity their parishioners offered. So needless to say, they struggled. Then in the late 1930s, Virginia decided she wanted to go back to being a traveling evangelist. So a now grown David accompanied his mother, driving her around, being a song leader and overall assistant. He married his first wife, Jane, soon to be known as Mother Eve, in 1944, and they had four children together. Now, they had regular legal names, but they called them Deborah, Aaron, Hosea, and Faith. Jane would later go on to say that David was always telling her that the Bible said a man could have more than one wife. Of course, Jane was against this completely, but she knew while he was out traveling and preaching that he was not faithful to her. So once David sort of veered off into his own lane, taking his wife and children with him, he became a minister in the Christian and Missionary Alliance in Valley Farms, Arizona. He was expelled though due to differences in teaching and sexual misconduct with another church employee, though David stated it was because, you know, he was working to support a greater racial diversity. David went back to Florida and back to his family, where he began to aggressively disapprove of evolution being taught in schools, so much so that he got into trouble with the law. He and his family then moved to Western Texas, still, you know, preaching about how Christ was, quote, more than the monkeys, unquote. But David Berg and his family finally landed in Huntington Beach, California, in 1968. So about his inspiration for this, his wife and children, he, they were all sitting around a campfire and singing under the Texas stars when David said, quote, it seemed like the hair stood upright on the back of my neck and I was so thrilled and the spirit of the Lord came upon me. I saw a picture of these young folks singing out before other young folks these same songs. They were just singing that night for their own edification, more or less, enjoying a little family fellowship out under the trees around the old campfire. And yet, 
As I heard them, it seemed as though I could see them singing before teenagers far and wide. I was thrilled. It came to me that if they could sing like this just for their own entertainment or pleasure, why couldn't they sing like this for other teenagers? If they enjoyed it, why wouldn't other teenagers enjoy it?" Unquote. So after moving to California, they ran a coffee shop. But of course, they preached their gospel to those who would hear it, focusing it mostly on teens of the area. A local group of teens calling themselves, quote, Jesus people were sort of existing on the fringe of the late 60s counterculture. They wore their hair long, they sported colorful clothing, they played their acoustic guitars on the beach, which was pretty much like any of the teens in that day and age. I mean, we all know what the hippie movement looked like. They preached about living simply and random acts of kindness and things of that nature. Now, David Berg's children formed their own little group for preaching and music and called themselves, quote, teens for Christ. So the Jesus people began to frequent the coffee shop and would stay and listen to David Berg preach. Around this time, David's mother, Virginia, passed away and David said it was, quote, a moment when my bitterness was transformed into a voice for revolution, unquote. You see, it dawned on him that in order to get the youth to follow him and listen to his preaching, he'd have to change his approach. He said, quote, I saw something was really happening and was really going to explode. I just knew it. I saw the Lord was really doing something. That's when I began to come down and teach in my dark glasses, beret, baggy pants, old torn jacket, and tennis shoes, unquote. He also wore Asian kimonos and did his best to try to look like the hippies that were starting to come in, in ever-increasing numbers. David's own children took their music and their sermons to the streets and began preaching to the hippies of Southern California. They read Bible verses to the young adults and prayed with them. David's message was, quote, forsake all for Jesus and to hell with the system. David's daughter, Faith, spoke about how easy it was to get people to follow her into her father's preaching. One member stated it was, quote, like walking into a big bubble of love, bright and shining, unquote. It was at this point that David changed the name of his group from Teens of Christ to Children of God, thinking this would help him be more appealing to the, you know, vulnerable and disaffected youth of the times. In early 1969, they had 50 members and in just eight months, that number grew to 200. David began traveling with his family preaching his gospel, and people literally dropped everything to join his caravan of pious revolutionaries. David spoke about the de-Christianization and decay in moral values of Western society. This, of course, morphed into how modern-day society was setting the stage for the coming of the Antichrist. He trained his disciples on how to prophetize to others in order to get them to join the children of God. Some of the draw was that there was no Bible study, no college or formal education needed. These kids would go out and spread the gospel of Jesus as David taught them. They picketed at schools and prisons. They had sit-ins, march-ins, protests, and everything the young adults loved. And not everything turned out bad for some of those members. There were ex-criminals who, you know, to this day said that that movement, good or bad, saved them from a life of crime. Back in Southern California in the early 1970s, things kind of began to change. First off, 
Jane divorced David and then David married Karen Zerby. The recruits themselves began wearing sackcloth dresses or robes, smearing their foreheads with ash as a symbol that the United States is about to be destroyed. They began to distribute and recite their, quote, warning tract that David's mother had written some years earlier. So here's what it says, quote, warning, turn your eyes toward Memphis, actually Egypt, for out of it shall come the great confusion. The author of confusion is even now marshalling his forces for the great confusion. He is gathering his forces from a great nation and eastern nations, friends that will join with him. So sudden will be the great confusion that it will cause a mighty widening of the eyes of those who have not discerned the signs of the times. But be ye not deceived. Be prepared and be not deceived by the great society, for it will come to travail and then bring forth the great confusion. Be prepared. Even now the skies are red, red with warning, and black, black with clouds gathering for the great confusion which is almost upon you. Unquote. David spoke about how the devil's own son would rise from Egypt and come to destroy America and the West, persecute and destroy the church, and rule the world for three and a half years just before Jesus' second coming. And after everything calms down, well, conveniently, Jesus and the children of God would then be the rulers of the world. Simple enough. So members of the children of God began moving in together all around the country in communes, which would house dozens of adults and their children. Everyone who lived in the communes were family. Once this had all been established, the followers began calling David Moses or Moses David, or even just dad, because they felt that he had led them away from darkness. In these communes, the people began stocking up supplies and provisions to wait out the end times. But the date David had stated came and went, and new dates had to be established. At some point, David began living in seclusion, but would still communicate with his people through one of his most trusted advisors and followers. While that follower and top advisor was reading from the Bible aloud, they came across a verse in Ezekiel. It's Ezekiel 34 verse 23 and it states, quote, I will place over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will tend them. He will tend them and be their shepherd, unquote. So, of course, this class began shouting and speaking in tongues, one witness said with joy at hearing this. Someone wrote to David telling him of this revelation, to which he wrote back stating that he, you know, mulled over it in his mind, and then he said that God asked him, why do you deny your name, David? And so David realized he was the... I guess, ultimate shepherd over the people, the biblical prophet. Only scholars say that the David of that passage is actually the bringer of the end of the world. David began sending his teachings and prophecies in kind of a newsletter format that he called Mo's Letters. In 1971, one of his letters titled A Shepherd Time Story talked about happy folds where children of God members quote protected little lambs who laugh and sing and dance and play and fuck and bear lots of little lambs and the shepherds like it unquote another communication from David or Mo said quote I was lying between two naked women in our camper when I first received the gift of tongues. 
the one I was making love to would suddenly turn into one of these beautiful goddesses and I would immediately explode in an orgasm of tremendous spiritual power while at the same time prophesizing violently in some foreign tongue. Witnesses said after this, he walked out of his camper with these chains wrapped around his body. He stated that, quote, this is what the system marriage will do to you. But Jesus is going to set us free. And then he, you know, threw the chains off. He then took in a 19 year old lover, David himself now being 52 years old. David also accumulated a number of wives. His Mo letters became the guiding light to his followers and whoever drew the pictures, he had them illustrate him as a lion, king of the jungle. David created his own doctrine called, quote, the law of love. So let's get into that. The law of love is, according to David, the foundation of Christianity, the all-encompassing principle of sacrificial love for God and others by which all Christians should conduct their lives based on Jesus' commandment of love God and our neighbors." Unquote. It's the to love thy neighbor as thyself and so on and that seems fair enough. But he also blended this biblical idea with the free love ideals and sexual revolution that was going on during those times. His law of love taught members to sacrifice anything and everything in the name of love. Total and complete freedom from the bondage of the law. This was setting them up for something quite bad. In 1974, David introduced what he called flirty fishing. This was his new version in how to get more recruits for his now sexualized cult. Members were encouraged to initiate sexual relations with non-members in order to convert them and gain more supporters. This also included married women who were to disregard their husbands and let any man sleep with her that wished to, either because they were a follower or a potential follower. You know what else was going on behind the scenes? David was running a child sex ring. Two of his own daughters would later state that they were forced into sexual relationships with their father. One claimed her father tried to get her to have sex with him several times. The other daughter reportedly had a continuous sexual relationship with her father. Now, toward the late 70s, he was preaching about sexual sharing to all of his followers and their children. He wrote, quote, God created boys and girls able to have children by about 12 years of age. Unquote. The illustration that accompanied that was of mothers performing oral sex on a little boy. In another illustration, an adult woman and a toddler were lying naked in a bed, the woman's hand uncomfortably close to the toddler's genitalia. The caption read, quote, Well, they told us to go to bed. Unquote. And yet another illustration shows a woman lying naked on a bed, her arms out to her sides looking very much like the Christian crucified Jesus, with a nail, literally nailing her genitals to the bed, and she's wearing this calm and serene face. An actual follower said in an interview on 2020, quote, It's just a piece of educational material. It's actually fun to watch a child, in this case, experience life." Unquote. Parents were reassured that by allowing their children to explore sex at any age, they were raising their children the natural way. An ex-member later wrote, quote, The free expression of sexuality, including fornication, adultery, lesbianism, though not male homosexuality, and incest were not just permitted, 
but encouraged, unquote. David released a report of sorts stating that the flirty fishers had, quote, witnessed to over a quarter of a million souls, loved over 25,000 of them, and won about 19,000 to the Lord, unquote. By 1981, literally hundreds of Jesus babies were born as a result of flirty fishing. By this point, the Children of God cult had more than 130 communes around the world, with more than 10,000 full-time members living in nearly 1,700 homes. And now they officially renamed themselves as The Family. David then fled to England to escape the pedophilia rumors that surrounded him and the commune in Texas, trying to convince, you know, these worried parents that all was well, held a concert for them, you know, to show them how the family was normal, you know, completely fine. Needless to say, the parents didn't fall for it. And after, the commune was basically ordered to leave the area. Those same parents then began to group together to form the first ever real anti-cult movement. The parents that could get their hands on some of those Mo letters with pornographic illustrations and the teaching of free love and free sex showed them to other parents speaking about how this group was not of God. Somehow in England, David found out that the police were coming for him. So he told the people that were with him that God came to him in the middle of the night and told him that he had to leave the country that day. And, you know, I suppose the Lord was right because not long after they crossed over into France, the authorities had closed the borders so that they could arrest him and charge him with debauchery and other things. While in hiding, David began communicating using a video camera. One video he filmed shows a couple sitting in a field of grass, you know, hugging and being overall affectionate. When this man with his blazer thrown over his shoulder is walking along, he stops and he sees this couple kind of canoodling and he hangs his head in loneliness and keeps walking. The other man puts his arm out to suggest to his wife to go talk to that man and she runs to catch him. This video was about flirty fishing. Other videos show women dancing seductively and stripping almost completely naked, definitely topless, in front of an audience that included men, women, and children. There were videos of women masturbating and calling out that they loved David while they were having their orgasm. And they were also calling David dad and Little girls were then filmed doing the same, including one of his own granddaughters. By 1984, David was on the run again. Interpol issued a warrant for his arrest, charged with running a prostitution ring. He began drinking heavily and he was becoming impotent and running out of places to hide. His Mo letters started becoming very, very bizarre, showing signs of paranoia about different racial groups and encouraging mothers to masturbate their little boys to sleep. Anyone outside of his cult were hypocrites, and he wrote of pagan goddesses, which is obviously not Christian. David even said that his one regret was not sleeping with his own mother. So the granddaughter who starred in one of his little child pornographic videos did come to live with him. And during her time there, she supposedly had several mental breakdowns. So David and his entourage performed exorcisms on her. One of his followers stated that after an exorcism, she'd calm back down for a few months and then begin to break down again. She would later go on to say that her grandfather sexually abused her. In 1992, David was becoming ill. He was focused more on the end times. 
In May of 1992, the police began raiding two Children of God communities around Sydney, Australia. 144 children were rescued from the communes. Other homes were raided in Europe and South America, but they could not find David. In October of 1994, David Berg died and he was cremated. Now, there were court hearings all over who judged against the Children of God members and the remaining free members insisted that they were no longer practicing pedophilia. Unfortunately, and ultimately, the family was acquitted of all charges. There were, of course, as you can imagine, so very many children born into this world, never having known anything outside of these practices. The late River Phoenix, as well as his little brother and actor Joaquin Phoenix, along with their siblings, are some examples. Rose McGowan, who has been speaking out about Harvey Weinstein, was also born into this twisted world. Another example is one of David's wives who had already had a son when she met David. The son's name was Ricky Rodriguez. David had had this prophecy, this, this vision that Ricky was to be the religion's next leader. Ricky grew up watching people have sex and was encouraged to fondle his nanny and he was also molested. And these instances were photographed and put in a book that David published called the Davidito book. It was an instructional manual on how to raise children. Finally, in 2000, Ricky left the group. In 2005, he took a video of himself where he was sitting at a table full of tasers, gags, duct tape and knives. He said quite calmly that his goal was to bring down his own mother. A video of his filmed speech does exist on YouTube. That night, he found his old nanny instead and he took her to dinner. He invited her back to his apartment where he then stabbed her to death. And then hours later, he shot himself in the head. And as a second generation family member, he was far from being an isolated suicide case. A staggering but unsurprising number of children who grew up in that killed themselves. And as if that's not bad enough, this cult is still around. Yeah, I'm not kidding you. It's now called the Family International and they have an official website. It's the familyinternational.org. Its front page of the website shows what appears to be an older teen sitting among three small children. They boast having influence all over the world. So guys, that's it. If you enjoyed this podcast about the children of God and want me to do further stories about cults, let me know by sending me a DM on Instagram at serial underscore killing or a comment on the YouTube channel under the same name of this podcast or throw me an email to serial killing Instagram, all one word, at gmail.com. Thank you so, so much for listening and have a great day.